now before going to understand why you know we cannot take arbitrary number of stages in pipeline we will see that further you should understand the buffers which are required in between the stages after that i'll explain you why we cannot have you know any number of stages let us uh, take the five stage model instruction fetch here you are decoding it then you are doing computation here then memory access after that write back right so this is the way hardware is designed in stages sir why these buffers are required so one important aspect of pipelining otherwise one important thing in pipelining is buffers why because the stage number 1 did you remember in roti making whenever you make a ball that means the stage number 1 prepares a ball that should be forwarded to the second person right what if that second person is busy like how they communicate so they can have this kind of plate okay maybe so the first person seriously prepare the ball and he will keep here then through this the second person will take that means you know this balls will be taken from the plate the plate will work as a buffer in that way these two stages can use a plate in between them so that they can you know work without any disturbance right in the same way so when you have multiple stages then if we have buffers so that will be really helpful so what these buffers are going to do we'll see in the early morning when for the first one instruction got fetched here see this stage is going to do the instruction fetch once instruction fetch is done that instruction which is fetched that will be forwarded to this buffer okay assume that this buffer will have enough space so that we can keep this buffer is nothing but some set of registers okay so one register might contain that instruction okay now that is about this buffer b1 before buffer b1 is going to have an instruction then what is the next stage decoding right so this inter stage buffer is going to be connected to the instruction decode stage such a way that in every clock cycle that instruction decode will take the data from this buffer such a way we have to design the system right so that instruction decode will take that instruction and it will decode it and it will generate appropriate control signals required for the remaining operation like for addition the appropriate signals for subtraction appropriate signals for write back stage appropriate signals for memory access appropriate signals so all that collective control signals will be prepared by this instruction decode stage at the same time what this stage is going to do is it is going to read some of the register addresses from the register file correct recall example the instruction is add r1 r2 r3 so we will be reading r2 comma r3 comma r1 from this register file correct we will be reading the data of course r2 comma r3 and we and the address of r1 because the result should be stored in r1 right that's why we have to read value of r2 value of r3 and we have to read address of r1 and we have to send that to next stage because in this stage are you doing all that stuff addition everything no right that's why in the decode stage the so instruction will be decoded the appropriate signals control signals will be generated apart from that what else you want r1 r2 r3 the values will be read okay now values of r2 r3 and address of r1 so that's why inter stage buffer b2 is going to have two operands that we will be reading and immediate value sometimes you will be writing instruction like add r1 r2 50 then through the instruction sir where is this 50 will be located it is in instruction through the instruction this instruction decode stage is going to take that value 50 it will be pushing that 50 into this buffer so this buffer that's why contains two operands otherwise immediate value otherwise source register identifier what is source register identifier like r1 because after adding r2 comma 50 we have to store the result into r1's address correct that means uh, into r1 for that you should need the address of r1 that's why that also will be read from the register file that address we will be reading okay sorry so through the instruction we will be reading that now finally this buffer b2 contains operands and immediate value and source register identifier example in this case r1 now incremented pc value sir why pc value is required sir the reason for that i will tell you so the incremented pc value that means sir uh, do we need to increment program counter yes in the decode stage otherwise in the fetch stage already program counter will be incremented correct maybe in fetch stage we can increment it not a problem so in that incremented program counter value also first of all it will be pushed into buffer b1 in the next clock cycle though that 
PC value will be pushed like this. All these buffers are connected like this. That's why this cable you see. Okay. Now, for every clock cycle, you can understand like this. Stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4, stage 5. These are the buffers. Okay. What is going to happen is, in the first clock cycle, instruction will be fetched. Right. Then after that, in the second clock cycle, that instructions uh, remaining details like you know program counter and uh, R, R1, R2, 50 immediate value everything will be pushed into interstage buffer B2. So finally what is your purpose uh, sir what is the goal? The goal is we have to carry the uh, I can say resources which are required for the further stages. So why program counter is required you ask me I will tell you. The incremented program counter sometimes we require especially for this kind of call instructions. Example you have an instruction called call R1. Example let's say this program counter currently is showing 100. After incrementing let's say it is 104. Then the execution of call R1 is nothing but in this execution we have to store 104 into a, temp, uh, a register called that link register. That is what the execution of call R1. For that what we have to store 104 to be remembered in the registers because you know that right whenever you have a function call return address should be stored in the link register it depends on the architecture don't go into much details finally to do that i want program counter to be remembered but i don't want to remember program counter now i want to remember program counter through the write back stage anything how to remember that program counter value by storing it into link register. Where is link register? In the register file. That means should we write something into register file? Yes. But generally when we write something into registers in the fifth stage in that way systematically we have divided correct. Example when will you do the roti fry in the third stage? Will you do in the first stage? No. Same way. So that's why but this stage interstage buffer B4 requires that in uh, sorry this Fifth stage requires that information program counter that's why that program counter value will be you know forwarded to this buffer after that this buffer after that this buffer in that way slowly that will come to appropriate stage right. Similarly all the essential values that's why incremented program counter value will come to B2. Now what else will come control signals. All the control signals which are generated by decode stage because this is the buffer between decode stage and compute stage. Just now after decoding you get all possible control signals. What is the meaning of control signal? Already I taught you in control unit, right? These control signals are going to be generated appropriately for appropriate circuits at appropriate time. That will be designed, decided by control unit, don't worry. So that's why signals will be passed. So this stage, this stage, every stage is going to use some of the control signals. Example here in the register right back some control signals are required. But who is having that all control signals? Instruction decode stage. That's why that signals will be passed. That is enough. Now come to the next stage. What is going to ha uh, happen here? Computation will be done, right? So that arithmetic will be done, right? Example, if it is adding instruction, R2, 50 will be added here. So R2 and 50 are already available in the buffer B2. That's why buffers are important. Now you are, these buffers are connected to compute stage such a way that whenever computation takes place, appropriate registers will be taken and added okay now after that the comp result will come to buffer b3 one essential thing this buffer b3 is going to hold is what the result computation result right that's why result of alu and what else increment incremented pc value don't ask me again because finally that incremented pc value should be stored in the register file in the fifth stage that's why we are in third stage now fourth stage right that sorry uh, we are in, at end of the third stage so that's why that should be forwarded finally the program counter value will be forwarded here so that's why the buffer b3 contains result of alu incremented pc value which comes from here to here like this then address that address that feeds memory stage yes so this computation sometimes generates memory address we know that right that also will be stored here either result will be stored maybe so case number one Maybe result of ALU. Second one, sometimes we using the ALU, we generate effective memory address, correct? So that also will be stored in the buffer, right? What is the purpose of that? To access next, in the next stage, I am going to access the memory. For that, I need memory. From where it comes? Through this 
computation stage and understand now apart from that data to be written sometimes you have to write, write the data right example let's say the instruction is store store it's very easy store r1 100 of r2 the r1's value to be stored in 100 plus r2 for that i want content of r1 right that's why we have to read content of r1 which we are going to read in the this stage right instruction decode stage that will come to this buffer from here to here it will from i mean come in that way everything all essential register values will be forwarded if you understand what kind of executions uh, will take place in this one then you can understand what information will be stored in which buffer understand now so you understood that finally data to be written because so in the memory access stage we will be writing some data into memory for that i want that data that will be propagated in that way now similarly what about this stage what b4 contains now by this time without seeing this we can easily answer interstage buffer b4's purpose is to help in the write back stage correct in the write back stage what are you going to do sometimes the result of this computation will be stored back right that's why already if this computation result is stored here that will be propagated so finally i can say that interstage buffer b4 should get alu result otherwise result of memory access correct because in the memory access stage we access the memory that will come from the memory and that will be stored in this buffer so that in the next stage that means in the next clock cycle that will be moved to register file that's why this one incremented program counter value yes so since you know so long we are forwarding that right initially the program counter is incremented in phase stage it will come to this buffer eventually it will come here in the next clock cycle it will come here in the next clock cycle it will come here in that way every clock cycle moves the data so that's why in that way we forward the data understand this is the way you know your instruction will be executed now if you see one thing let's uh, try to understand this entire thing whatever i taught you with one example example let's say that simple instruction is add r1 r2 r3 what is going to happen you know uh, let's observe this with for every clock cycle in the first clock cycle forget about pipelining so far you know we though this model is for pipelining just first understand let's say you are executing one instruction what is going to happen okay example in the first clock cycle so this is your clock right so in the first clock cycle that instruction will be fetched so that let us say this is i1 i1 will come to this buffer right okay now in the second clock cycle now if this instruction decode works sir why the instruction decode should work in in the second clock cycle why not in the first clock cycle that is pipelining right we will be doing that assume that let's say you are executing serially first of all okay entire instruction one execution followed by i2 if you do like sequentially then after that if you understand pipelining that will be easy okay first ex understand sequential execution though this structure is for pipelining this is pipelining model only that's why we are using buffers but first understand if you use this one for sequential execution what is going to happen we'll see let us observe at time t equal to 1 okay so when uh, in the first clock cycle you have instruction here right that will be buffered here in the second clock cycle what happens that instruction is add r1 r2 r3 right okay then r2 r3 will be read right so through instruction we will be reading r2 i and r3 we will be keeping in this buffer my dear buffer b2 you remember it in the second clock cycle in the third clock cycle what is going to happen and one more thing that program counter assume that program counter is 100 and it is incremented that 104 also will be carried program counter value program counter value and instruction here now here in the next clock cycle what happens this data will be forwarded essential data what is essential data for this stage so that will be this r2 and r3 will be connected here so that r2 plus r3 will be added the result will be forwarded now r2 r3 will not be forwarded to the next buffer next stage but r2 plus r3 will be forwarded okay now any memory access you have no right program counter also will be forwarded next now in this stage interstage buffer before here what we do is already and one more thing this r1 also will be forwarded everywhere okay r1 will come like this r1 address of r1 
So now in this stage, this buffer contains address of R1 and value of R2 plus R3 which comes from this compute result and which initially it comes here after that here. Then in the next clock cycle, R2 plus R3 will be moved to register R1. So in that way, one instruction can be executed. Now what I want to tell you is, in the first clock cycle, instruction will come here. In the next clock cycle, appropriate things will come here. In the next clock cycle, result will come here, essential things. In the next clock cycle, that result will come here, of course. Again, result will come here. In the next clock cycle, the result will be stored, right? In that way, we can understand this entire thing in five clock cycles, right? Now, my question is, in the first clock cycle, what this instruction fetch is doing? In the first clock cycle, that instruction fetch is fetching the instruction. But what that instruction fetch unit is doing in the second clock cycle? Nothing. In the pipelining, that's why we ask that instruction fetch unit to fetch the second instruction. That's why now you can feel like this. What is going to happen is, rather than showing that all the register R1, R2, R3, you know, it will be clumsy. Okay. Just keep that in mind that essential details will be forwarded. So what we do is, in the first clock cycle, I1 will be fetched here. In the second clock cycle, that I1's important information will be forwarded here. Then in the second clock cycle, at the same time, we have to design our system so that I2 should be fetched. In the third clock cycle, this I2's information will be forwarded here, essential information. I3's uh, sorry, I1's essential information will be forwarded here and I3 will be fetched. Now, the last time I am going to cover. In the next clock cycle, what we are going to do is that I3, whatever you fetched, right, it will be moved to the decode stage. That means, so this buffer data will be moved here. So that what is going to happen is, so I4 will be fetched here. Then that I3's essential information will be forwarded here. I2's essential information will be forwarded here, I1's essential information will be forwarded and the appropriate stage will work in that way. So, you know, essential things will be moved. So that I can say that this unit is fetching I4, this unit is working on I3, maybe this unit is working on I2, this unit is working on I1 with help of the intermediate buffers. Understand? So this is the idea about pipelining. Don't worry. So we will be seeing very clearly how this pipelining, you know, can uh, help us in executing multiple instructions. But here you should understand one more thing. There are some problems with pipelining. What is that problem is? The first problem is hazards. So you are going to have three kinds of hazards. We will be covering one by one. First of all, the first hazard is structural hazard. Okay. We have to discuss structural hazard. Second one, uh, data hazards. The third one is control hazards. One by one, we have to discuss. If you discuss these hazards, then almost pipelining will be over. Okay. Now, let us begin with structural hazard. What is structural hazard? We will see. Example, let's say instruction fetch unit requires memory access. You have only one memory. Already we, I discussed it, but again I am going to teach it. So, this is your main memory and you have instructions, data, everything here. Now, example, let's say what if this instruction fetch stage is executing its work, that, that means it is fetching an instruction. At the same time, this memory access stage is also working because that is what you planned, right? What happens then? Maybe this memory access stage requires memory. This instruction fetch obviously requires memory, correct? So two people. Assume that we have only one address bus, one data bus. So assume that we have sub, you know, only one bus for address, one bus for data. That means we supply address here and we get the data from this bus. So address bus, data bus. Now first of all focus on that instruction fetch. In the instruction fetch what is going to happen is the program counter contains address, right? So that program counter let us say we connect it to address bus. So that, so this address will be, you know, taken by this address bus and the appropriate data will be given into some data register. Assume that let's say we have memory data register. So into memory data register, let's say the data is coming. So finally, what I want to tell you is, so to access the memory, you are using address bus and data bus simultaneously, right? Now, if at the same time, example, let's say in seventh clock cycle, we are fetching one seventh instruction. 
at the same time probably some instructions uh, require some data probably maybe let us say i4 okay so that i4 instruction requires to uh, fetch operands in this one we want to fetch operands then how you do it at that time this memory is busy fetching one instruction right so that's why so we cannot do memory access unless we have another memory with al along with otherwise maybe same memory with so different buses right so that's why i want to say that we require two units of memory that's why generally what happens is in the architecture what they do is they create separate memories like you know for instruction there will be separate memory let us call it as instruction memory okay it will have again address and data buses here also we have data memory when you have this kind of two units now there is no clash right always that instruction fetch unit deals with this memory and always this memory access stage might deal with data so there will not be any uh, hardware problem right so these two hardware components are independent so we can work them or we can make work them simultaneously that is what about structural hazard structural hazard is nothing but you know hazard sir what is hazard first of all any due to any reason if you stall the pipeline stalling again sir what is stalling stopping the pipeline at any reason at any cost sometimes what happens you can't do the work parallelly then at that time we have to stop the pipeline okay so we'll see elaborate the details later so whenever you are stopping the pipeline for some time being because of your you know problems with resources then we say that it is structural hazard hazard means stopping the pipeline whatever causes stopping the pipeline is structural hazard i mean hazard especially if that hazard is because of the hardware units okay then that is structural hazard now how to avoid that structural hazard one easy solution is example let's say there is a clash like instruction fetch and memory access require same memory right so duplicate it that's why by having multiple resources of same type instruction fetch re requires memory resource another stage also requires memory resource then have two copies in that way we can do sometimes example let's say you want to do arithmetic in two stages of course this is not the case with this one assume that there are two stages and both wants to do arithmetic that means you know one stage requires alu another stage also requires alu okay forget about the reason why we require if you have such kind of model then what is going to happen we can't make 3 comma 5 work at a time simultaneously then 3 will wait for 5 5 will wait for 3 so that is hazard right we have to stall the pipeline so that is again structural hazard we have to avoid that structural hazard carefully we have to design our system now what i want to tell you is in this five stage model if only the problem comes with instruction fetch and memory access apart from that all are independent okay so by having multiple units of memory that means instruction memory separately and data memory separately we can avoid the structural hazard that is done now we'll talk about data hazards and control hazards one by one let us begin with data hazard okay 